you guys would go ahead and grab a seat. We're going to get started, spend some time in the Word this morning. Uh, we are continuing our series on Psalms in the summer. And I just love the book of Psalms for, for various reasons. As the saints have for hundreds of years, the Psalms have been key portions of scriptures to, to inspire the worship of God, to inform us about who God is. Um, and here's the interesting fact, too, that in the New Testament, the book of Psalms is quoted more than any Old Testament book. The book of Psalms is quoted in the New Testament. The New Testament writers refer back to and quote and allude to the book of Psalms more than any other book in the Bible, uh, Old Testament book. And so uh, one, of the, one of the reasons why so many people love the Psalms, including myself, is because they're so real and they're so raw and they, uh, they express raw emotion whether that's a positive, joyful, delightful emotion, or whether it's a, a sorrow and lament, uh, discouragement, pain. It, it just, uh, the Psalms model for us a personal relationship with God. And so if you want to go deeper in your relationship with God, you can do what saints of old have done for hundreds of years and use these Psalms to move you into times of communion with the Father, into times of praise, into uh, the Psalms give you words. Uh, it helps you articulate things that are in your heart. It's amazing how, um, how the Psalms can do that, how songs can do that. Many of the Psalms are songs. Songs often give us articulation of like what's inside of us and we don't know how to say it. It gives us expression of those things uh, within us. And then it also teaches us. The book of Psalms teach us. Um, we're going to look at Psalm, Psalm 95. And this is actually one of the top Psalms um, that has been used to call the people of God to worship. In this Psalm, we see uh, the psalmist telling us, what worship is, it describes what worship is. In this psalm, we see uh, how to worship. There, there are a few calls to worship, okay? And in this psalm, there are reasons why we should worship, worship God. And we all need that because we, you know, we need to have some, some, some biblical conviction and truth behind why we're singing, why we're sacrificing and giving our lives to follow this God. We, we worship, worship demands that, it, that each part of us engage God. So it's one of the few activities that we do that requires us to, to engage God with heart, soul, mind, and strength. Worship demands all of us. Our whole being, as uh, Paul said in Romans 12, uh, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, your whole being, all that you are, as a living sacrifice to God. And throughout the Psalms, the psalmist gives these calls to worship God in various ways. And some of them are very exuberant, as we see in this text. They're, they're very expressive and very charismatic and then some of them are very reflective and, and, and reverent. And so we're going to see that in this psalm. Psalm 95, 1 through um, 11, if you would stand with me for the reading of God's word. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it. And his hands form the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as, as at Meribah, as on the day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test 
and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. For 40 years, I loathed that generation and said, they are a people who go astray in their hearts. They have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. This is the word of the Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Here's the big idea. Here's where we're going in the text. That God has called his people to worship him with joy, with reverence, with obedience to him. Because he is our deliverer. He is our God. He is our king. He's our maker. And he is our shepherd. In the first two verses we see... Uh, this call to worship, and it is a call that is very expressive. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. This is a call to worship God exuberantly, to express with emotion God's worth to praise Him with joy and delight in our hearts. And I know this isn't natural for us. Well, maybe in a sense it is. It is natural for us because those of us who love sports or if there's there's an activity that you really like, you can get into that and make some, some delightful, joyful noises about whatever that activity or whatever that object or person or whatever that thing is. You can make some, you can make a joyful noise. And you don't have to be a musician or an excellent singer to do this. Okay, Anybody can make a joyful noise. God has wired us to be able to do this. Uh, Some young ladies that I've heard before, that when they start really laughing really hard, this little snort comes out. (laughs) And it's just this joyful noise. And they don't mean to make it, but it just comes out because they're laughing so hard. Right? And so there's this joyful noise, and they may get embarrassed about it, you know. We, we may f- feel silly making a joyful noise to God before other people, but God likes it. God likes it when his people make a joyful noise to him because he's our treasure, because he's our greatest joy, because we love him, because we care about him more than anything else in this world. So we're freed up. To make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation because we've seen God save us, deliver us, redeem us, and set us free. So we're freed up to make a joyful noise to our God. And that's what God calls us to. And I want to call us as a church to worship God in this way. And this may seem a little charismatic. And that's okay to be a little charismatic because when you read the Psalms, you'll see that David was very charismatic. He was very expressive. God doesn't just want our mind and our intellect to be surrendered to him. He he doesn't want just our will to be surrendered to him. He wants our emotions. He wants our whole being, our affections. He wants our hearts. And he's worthy of that devotion, that affection, that worship. You know, we do this at, at, at football games. I was just, you know, we had uh, this past year, we had uh, some folks over from CCI Garland over at our home to watch the football game. The Super Bowl was the, the Patriots and the Falcons. Kevin, you, you and your brother are going for the Falcons, right? They lost, right? Okay, Kevin and his brother were uh, very expressive about their team. He loves sports. They love sports. They get into sports. You know, I didn't have very much skin in the game because, I mean, I like sports, but, you know, I'd prefer the Cowboys to be in the Super Bowl if there's a team that's going to be in the Super Bowl. And all the Dallasites said, Amen. all right. And so, so I picked the team, you know, uh, the Patriots. Yeah, it was Tom Brady. Tom Brady. Okay, so I'm like, yeah, go, go Patriots, and I'm, I want to counteract the, the Falcon praise and cheer in, in the um, in, in the room, and we just had a good time. But and when a, one of the teams made a good play or scored a touchdown, we got excited. Some of us did, right? We got, and I didn't even have much skin in the game, as I said. I'm not super big on. on I mean, I like to play sports, but. 
But we got excited. It's fun. And, and we, we express our excitement with shouts, with joyful noises, with, yeah, come on, you know. And that's just what we do. We're wired to do that. And God wants us to do that with it when it comes to him. You see, if we can do that over sports and things that, that really mean nothing when it comes to eternity, when it's all said and done, we'll have very little value in eternity, then surely we can do this about God and his kingdom and the things of God. And we should truly get excited about him. We should praise him joyfully. We, uh, and, and actually, as we do this, this is good and healthy for our souls. We're made for this. When we don't do this with God... And, and we don't transfer our worship to him as we're designed to and created to. We find other objects, other people, other things to worship and give our affections to, to give our praise to, to give our devotion to. And it leaves us broken. It leaves us disappointed. It leaves us feeling empty because those idols, those little gods can never deliver Psalm 16, 4 says, those who chase after other gods will be filled with sorrow. Those who chase after other gods will be filled with sorrow. Making an idol and worshiping any other god will break your heart and crumble your life and destroy your soul. But worshiping God will bring healing and wholeness to your soul because you were made for that. And God knows that he is the only one that you can give all of your affection, all of your devotion, all of your love, all of your worship to and not be disappointed, not be broken, not be let down because he's faithful. He's good. He's perfect. He's strong. He's loving. Amen. Uh, and in Psalm 16, 11, it, there's a contrast between that sorrow that idolaters experience and there's a contrast between the worshipers of God. It says, in the presence, in your presence is the fullness of joy. And at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. There's the contrast. And so we should come before God with joy. Okay? In corporate worship. And then as we gather together in corporate worship, our joy should increase and abound because we're focusing in on this God. Our God. The great God, the great king, our shepherd, our maker, our rock of salvation, because we're focusing in on who he is and our hearts find joy in who he is. In the midst of this broken world that we're surrounded by and the news reports of this broken world that we're surrounded by, when we come to God in corporate worship, we get our eyes off of those things. Off, off of the corruption of this creation and on to the perfection and beauty of our creator. So we're made for this. And this will help us with our joy. This will help guard our hearts from being heartbroken. We're called to worship with joy, with reverence, obedience, because he is our deliverer, our God, our king, our maker. Let me just uh, address what is worship. Give, give a definition. Worship is attributing ultimate value to someone or something. It's attributing ultimate value to someone or something. Um, Tim Keller, he illustrates this well with, a, with an illustration of a lady uh, who had an old piece of jewelry. Uh, and her attitude towards that old piece of jewelry was, you know, that old thing and, you know, it was sitting in the, the jewelry box and wasn't used very much. Uh, but then she went and got it appraised by a jeweler. And as the jeweler was looking at it, he was astounded by the, the details, the cuts, the beauty and the value of this piece of jewelry. It was worth so much. And this lady was sitting on it. it was, she inherited it through her family and it was passed on down. And she was like, oh, that piece of jewelry. Yeah, she hardly ever wore it. Uh, but then when, when, when she was able to discover the value of that piece of jewelry, she had a greater appreciation for it. And there are many people who treat God like an old piece of jewelry that has very little value. They've become familiar with God. And, and the things of God, and so their praise for him and delight in him is, has waned, and, and their, their love for him is, is cold, and their devotion to, them, to him is weak. But when you and I see the beauty 
of who he is, the glory of who he is, the value and the worth of him, then we're going to worship him appropriately with joy, with reverence, with obedience, with surrender to all that he is. Uh, because he's our, he's our, as the verse says, he's our rock of salvation. He delivers us. He has delivered Israel over and over and over again. Israel found deliverance from God. He delivered them out of Egypt. He delivered them from the hands of their enemies over and over again. And the church, he has delivered us through Jesus Christ once and for all. He has delivered us and he delivers us when we cry out to him in times of trouble. He's ever present. He's there. He shows up. We call upon his name. He shows up. He heals. He delivers. He sets free. He protects. He guides. He provides. This is our God. He's our rock of salvation. And when we see him as this and we see the value in who he is, we're going to worship him appropriately. Amen? And so uh, the the old English word, the the word worship comes from the old English word worship. Okay? So there's there's worth expressed in our worship. Okay? We're, we're expressing worth to God. I remember one time I was driving down the road. I, was, I felt like the Spirit was telling me to go talk to these young people playing football. And I was tired. I wanted to go home and eat and go rest. And I didn't feel like stopping and talking. So I just kept on driving. And, and I, I saw a street. I passed a street called Worth Street. And I just couldn't just keep going. As, as the thought came to my mind, is God worth my obedience? Is he worth that I just turn around and just go talk to those kids about jesus and so i did i turned around i went and talked to them and i'd love to tell you they got saved and became preachers and changed the world and stuff but i don't know what happened but but i shared i was faithful to that little prompting of the spirit because god's worth it and god speaks to us every day there's these little promptings and as this text says today if you'll hear his voice don't harden your heart Okay, behold his worth, his beauty, his glory, and respond to it with obedience, with surrender, with devotion. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, There there were also some missionaries, um, uh, Moravian missionaries, that were trying to reach this people group that were slaves on an island. And the only way that they could get onto that island was unless they became slaves themselves. And so they decided to make a great sacrifice, leaving their home and their comforts and their family. And they go on this boat and they sell themselves as slaves to, to reach this people group. And as they're on that boat, can you just imagine saying goodbye to your friends and family? Just, just by, because for the gospel's sake and for the sake of this people group. And as they're on the boat, they say, as they're saying goodbye to friends and family. And it could be heard. Worthy is the lamb to receive the reward of his suffering. Worthy is the lamb to receive the reward of his suffering. Jesus is worth it. He's worth our worship. He's worth everything that we give him. And he wants it all. And he actually knows. He knows that it's actually our to our greatest joy and our greatest good for us to give him all. Not just a little part of our heart. You can have this on Sunday and maybe this on Wednesday and maybe I'll do this, you know, spend some time with you during a week or something. He wants it all. He wants to walk with you in life and he wants you to commune with him and find your joy, your strength, your salvation in him. He wants to shepherd us as a good shepherd. And so when we have this kind of relationship with God, it's just fitting and appropriate to sing joyfully to make joyful noises to God, to to sing to him with this abandon and this this, um, undignified expression as David did. David danced before God when they got the Ark of the Covenant. Uh, The Ark of the Covenant got returned to Israel, and David was just like overjoyed. He was leaping, he was singing, and he had this kind of dress garment on, and he was kind of looking goofy, especially for a king. He was undignified before the people, and his, his wife, Michal, Michael, did not like what was going on. She was like, I can't believe it. you're doing that as a king. And so, but David said, I will become more undignified than this. He celebrated God. God was his greatest joy and treasure. And therefore, as he focused on the beauty and the greatness of who God is, his eyes weren't on himself. 
and the opinions of other people around him. And so if you're somebody who struggles to express unhindered worship to God, and, and we all have some hindrance in our worship of God. Our worship is not perfect. Okay? None, nobody's worship is perfect. Perfectly pure. All of us struggle with some hindrances when it comes to worship. We don't worship God perfectly as we ought to. Right? But one of the things that's great about our God is that when we fail to worship him as we ought to, he is, he's merciful and he's gracious. The other gods that we worship aren't, aren't so forgiving. The other idols that we make aren't so forgiving, but our God is merciful and gracious even though we bring uh, uh, an offering of worship that isn't completely perfect. So worship is ascribing ultimate value to God, to someone or something. Uh, this psalm also tells us how to worship. So it, it tells us to worship the Lord with exuberance and with emotion. Okay, uh, God, God likes it when we express emotion to him, our affection, our heart affection. I mean, husbands or wives, think about this. If, if your husband or your wife says, hey, sweetie, I want, I want to go on a date. Can we go on a date tonight? And there's no, there's no delight. There's no emotion. Can we go? In, in that, in being with that person, in the thought of being with your spouse, how, how will your spouse feel, right? You're, you, you want the, the heart of your spouse. You want the affections of your spouse, the love, and, and you want to know that they're completely for you. And we have that in God. And God demands that back from us, that we give him our affections, our emotions, that we worship him exuberantly, make a joyful noise to him. There's also reason behind why we should do this. For he is a great God and a great king above all gods. And in his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, for his hands formed the dry land. So our God is not just one of many little gods. He's the one true God. He's the great God and the great king. He reigns over all the other so-called gods. He's the one true God, the one true king. And this is huge because when, when you got God as your king, when you got God as the one who is in charge of your life and the world, it gives reason to rejoice. Psalm 97, 1 says, let, let the, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. So because God is king, he's the great God, he's the rock of our salvation, and he's our maker. He made us. He formed us. He formed the depths of the earth, the heights of the mountains. He formed the sea. He made it all. So the psalmist is alluding back to Genesis to inspire worship. The reality of our creator should inspire our worship of the creator and not the creation. We should look at the creation and be inspired to give our affection and devotion and praise to God, our creator. Uh, here's just a couple of facts. So the highest mountain is Mount Everest, uh, which is about 29,000 feet, 29 uh, and 20, 29,000 and 28 feet and nine inches. I don't know how they got the nine inches and in measuring that thing. Uh, but but that's the, the highest mountain. OK, uh, in the world. God made that. God, that was nothing for God. I mean, that was simple for God to make. OK, God made that. This is. We're talking about the greatness of our God. The psalmist expounds a little bit on how God is great, okay? And, and how he is distinct from all the other so-called gods. He's the one who made all this, okay? Those other gods are made by man, okay? But God has made all of this, the, the whole world, and he's made you and I. He formed us in his wisdom and in his power. He has made us um, the... The deepest part of the sea is known as the Challenger Deep, and it is approximately 36,200 feet. Could you imagine being down there for any amount of time? You know? Um, and then the, uh, the, the core of the earth, uh, let's see, it's about 4,000, I believe it's 4,000 feet to the core of the earth. Should be here in my notes somewhere. Yeah, 4,000 4, miles, I'm sorry. The, core, the distance to the center of the earth is 4,000 miles deep. Is that crazy? So God made all this. He formed all this. And this is reason for us to worship him because he is our 
creator. So the psalmist calls, tells us what worship is, describes what worship is, this joyful expression of, of, of God's worth. It tells us how to, to, to worship God, to sing joyfully. The psalmist tells us in the psalm why we should worship God, and he does this again and again. Verse 6, he says, Oh, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. And so the psalmist is instructing the people of God to worship in humility and reverence in our worship. So this is important because we don't want to just be a, a happy, clappy church. And we sing songs that are very shallow and we, we know how to get our praise on, but it's, it's merely emotional. We want to go deeper than just our emotions when it comes to our worship. Jesus said those who worship him must worship in spirit and in truth. And so we want to go deeper in our worship. There's also uh, a, a proper place in corporate worship for times of silence, reflection, kneeling and bowing and this repre- this this expresses reverence to God when we when we are meditating on who God is we're beholding who God is and then the weight of who he is presses us down the weight of his glory kabod is the Hebrew word for glory or it, it can also mean weight or weighty and the weight of who he is presses us down to kneel before him out of reverence for who he is, of his awesomeness, of his greatness. Some churches tend to, in their worship, in their corporate worship, they tend to focus on one more than the other. They tend to be lopsided, either just happy, clappy, very loud and noisy, which is great. But then there's also that, that time of reflection and, and kneeling and bowing and pondering. And so we want to be a church that, that does both in our corporate worship. We want to let loose and praise the Lord. Bless him, rejoice in him, delight in him, and, 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 and look a little foolish doing it, a little undignified doing it, because we do that at football games, right? We do that at sports games, but then we also, we, we want to go deeper in our worship. We want, to, we want to ponder who he is, and we want to respond to who he is in truth, in spirit, and in truth. And so let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. And when you ponder God being the great creator and you look at these massive mountains and you look at these, the, the vast depth of the ocean and, and just the, all the, the details of the earth, you and I should be humbled by the greatness of her God. You know, if we're not humbled by the greatness of who God is, then we, we probably got too small of a vision of who he is, of a view of who he is, and we got too big of a perspective of who we think we are and humanity is. And so it's, it's when we get a glimpse of his greatness and glory and goodness that we're humbled and we're awestruck and we bow before the Lord, our maker. Re- worship is our proper response. So joyful Joyful worship and then humble, reverent, reflective worship uh, is appropriate in corporate worship. And notice, notice all the, the, the we, let us, we, uh, for he is our God, we are his people. This is corporate language, okay? While it is very important that you have personal, intimate time with God daily, and that you have quiet times, that you shut the door, that you're getting still before God, that you're singing before God, you're setting your mind on Him, you're taking in His Word, and you're letting Him speak to you daily by yourself. All that should help prepare you for when you gather together with the people of God. Well, it should prepare you for, for your day, for, your, for life. But then when you gather together on, on, on these Sunday mornings, when we come together, if we've been worshiping God throughout our week, then Sunday morning shouldn't feel like we're changing gears. It's time to get in worship gear now. Boom, here we go. Praise the Lord. Right? So we've already been in that gear throughout the week. We've already been worshiping. And so when we come together on these Sunday mornings, if we're doing that faithfully, we should be able to express that joy, that delight. We should be able to kneel and bow. We should, we should be able to set our mind on God because we've been doing that. And what we sing and preach about here should all re- remind you of what you've already been, what God's been speaking to you about and, 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 and maybe take you deeper throughout this next week and what God's leading you into. 
Okay, he wants to take us so much deeper. God is real. He's the one true God. He's not. This isn't just a game that we play. This isn't just a religion and, and a religious duty where we're checking off a box. And I went to church this Sunday. We're talking about a relationship with the living God who knows us and loves us and cares for us. And, and that's the, the next reason why we should worship. Actually, um, yeah, the, the let's see. The, the next reason why we should worship is that he is our God. And we are his people. We are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. God is not just some distant deity out there in the galaxy governing the planets and the earth and keeping all things together. While he is the great God and the great king and he rules over all and that is sufficient enough to worship him. But this should take it even deeper in our worship of God. He is our God. He is our God. He is a personal, relational, intimate God who cares about the needs of his people. He cares about you. He cares about your family. He cares about your job. He cares about your hopes and dreams. He cares about the details of your life more than you do. And you can, that should free you up to cast all your cares on him. Because he cares for you. That should free you up to think more thoughts and greater thoughts about God. Because he's always thinking about you more than the, the number of sand, uh, grains of sand in the sea. Or his thoughts towards us, David says in Psalm 40. He's thinking about us. I mean, just let that soak in. Right now, God is thinking about you. I tell people that. Occasionally, as I'm at the store, I was at um, Best Buy uh, just last night, um, and I, so there was a guy named Paul, and I just asked him a question, and I said, man, if you, if you were to die today, do you feel like you're ready to, to meet God or stand before him? And he just kind of, like, he was like, man, nobody, nobody, I've been here for a while, nobody asked me that. So he's a, he's a Christian, and he just kind of, his heart had, he's gone astray, as, we, as this, this text talks about. Prone to wander, as we sing about, Lord, I feel it. Here's my heart. Take it, seal it. And, and he was just thinking, like, and he, we had this kind of divine moment where, where he's reminded that, that God's real and God is thinking about him. God sees him. In the busyness of his job and in the busyness of his life and the things that are going on, God's just kind of putting his finger, saying, hey, I'm right here. I'm right here. What about me? What about, what about our re- relationship, Mr. Paul? Uh, so he is our God. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. He is our good shepherd. Christ is our good shepherd. He tenderly cares for us. He has laid down his life for his sheep so that you and I can be secure and saved and set free and in fellowship with him. He, he tenderly cares for us. He is our God and we are his people and so uh, the last way that, that the psalmist instructs us to worship is uh, by listening and obeying God's voice. It says today, and this is quoted in the New Testament, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day of Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers put me to the test and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work for 40 years, I loathe that generation and said they are a people who go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. Therefore, I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. And so our worship shouldn't just be a Sunday morning thing. And when we come together corporately to worship God, our ears should be attuned and attentive to listen to what God is saying to us because he is speaking. The question is, are we listening? His sheep hear his voice. He's speaking. Today, it says, today. To, that's, that means right now, today. If you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. Don't, don't go astray in your heart. Let God's loving kindness and his tender whispers draw you closer to him. He's speaking. He's, and, then, and then throughout this week, obey what he's speaking to you. Let what we do here on Sunday mornings kind of 
tune you, tune the guitar, so to speak, tune your life, get your life in tune with him so that when you go back out into the busyness of your life, raising your children and working a job that you are worshiping and obeying him while you're there, because God wants worship of him to permeate every area of our lives. And if we don't do this, then our worship becomes much more hypocritical and very shallow if it's just a Sunday thing or a Wednesday thing. God wants it to be a 24-7 thing. Amen? And so worship Him by listening and obeying to His voice. And then here's another reason why we should worship Him. There are painful consequences for not worshiping Him. When we don't worship Him, we, we set up idols. Okay, We complain. We, we do what the children of Israel did. So the, the word Meribah, so this is referring to uh, accounts that happen in the Old Testament with the children of Israel, places. Uh, Meribah means strife. There's this strife. Okay, God delivers them from Egypt, and then, and then they're, they're, they, be, they grumble, they complain. They're, they're, they're accusing God and Moses of just not leading them well. And they complain. There's strife between their God who loves them. They have strife towards him. And then they test him. Massa means testing. They, there's strife. There's testing. And what an offense it is to a perfect, loving, mighty, wise God to test him and, say, and challenge his leadership and say, by our attitudes and by our, our complaints, that your leadership stinks. How offensive that is to God. His leadership is perfect. His leadership is perfect. And it's, it's us who go astray. He's not leading us the wrong way. He's leading us in paths of righteousness for his namesake. He's leading us beside still waters. He's leading us to places of rest where our souls will be restored. But some of us aren't following. If you're weary and worn out and your life is just falling apart emotionally, mentally, you're falling apart, let the good shepherd lead you into his rest. And that happens through coming to him in faith and doing what we're talking about here, worshiping him regardless of what's going on in your life. Because when he becomes everything in your life, you can be at rest about everything else that's going on, even when there's chaos or even when riches increase. Don't set your heart on them. Even when things are going well, you don't have to give your affections and and attention in an unhealthy way, unbalanced way to all the things going on in your life. Give your attention to God. And you'll find rest, you'll find joy, you'll find strength, you'll find wisdom, you'll find life in him. He's a good leader. It's us who stray. I I heard a story about an old couple driving down the road, and they've been married for 20, 30 years, and uh, driving down the road in the truck, and and, uh, the wife looks over to the the husband and says, Sweetie, you remember when when I used to sit right there next to you and as we would drive down the road? And those were such special times. I just felt like we were a lot closer during those times. And the husband, uh, just like an old, old, old husband could, can only do, he said, sweetie, I ain't never moved. <laughs> it just kept on driving. It was her that, that moved over, you know, right? And that's how it is in our relationship with God. You know, we're, we're like, oh, I remember back when I first became a Christian. It was so sweet and so awesome and how, how great that was or, or the good old days when this or that was happening and God was doing this in my life. And, and, and God's like, I've never moved. I've been here. God is faithful. He's there. And he cares. And he wants to be more involved and more intimate in our lives. But are we letting him? Are we drawing close to him? Are we drawing near to him and worshiping him? And so, so they, they, they didn't enter his rest. Hebrews picks up this and quotes this in Hebrews 3, 7 through 11. It says, Therefore the Holy Spirit says, Today if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. On the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works 40 years. They saw the mighty works of God and yet they, they doubted and they tested God and they complained. Therefore, I, pro- I was provoked with that generation and said they always go astray in their hearts. They have not known my ways. So as I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Now here's the exhortation. This is for the church. Okay. This, is, this, this doesn't just apply to Israel. Now, the New Testament writer of Hebrews is saying this is for the church. The Spirit speaking this. Take care, brothers, lest there be in, in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart, 
leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another daily, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. And so when we come together in corporate worship, this is something we do. We do this through our songs. We do this through our preaching. We do this through connecting with one another before, during, and after the service. Go out to lunch afterwards. Small groups, Wednesday night service. We're exhorting one another. We're encouraging one another to believe God, to follow God, to walk with God. Don't let your heart grow hard. Because of the, the, the deceitfulness of sin. Let your heart be tender before God. Worship Him. Love Him. And I'm going to finish with, with some application. Let go and get your praise on when it comes to Sunday morning. Okay? I think it's okay if we're a little more charismatic up in this place. This is the upper room, right? This is the upper room. It's okay if we get a little little hyped up in this upper room on the second floor here. Um, get your praise on, you know? Of course, don't whack people, you know, think about the person next to you in the sense that, that you're not, you know, distracting them or, you know, put your deodorant on. Don't be like, you know, you know, you smell good on. Um, don't be a distraction, but, but, but don't be distracted and, and overly self-conscious that, that you can't, like, cut loose and praise God. Okay? Be intentional about engaging God with your whole being. In corporate worship, your heart, your soul, your mind, your, your, your will, your body, your whole being. Some of us tend to maybe just be more reflective and intellectualize our worship. You know, that's good. But don't let it just be that. Don't let it just be this quiet, reflective, express to God your worship. And then, and then uh, don't just be emotional and expressive with your hands and your voice and, and your dance and do that. But also go deeper. Really think about who he is. And we're doing this for, we're expressing this to him, right? We're not, we're not putting on a show for people. Look how cool I am. I know that song. You know, or listen how good I, I sound when I sing that. You know, it, it, while we want to encourage and stir up love and good works and encourage one another's faith, you know, ultimately when we're coming together in corporate worship, we're seeking to bring him pleasure. We're, we're exalting him. Now, we are exhorting and encouraging one another, but we're, the primary focus is on him. And as we do that, we, we uh, encourage one another best. Listen for God's voice in corporate worship. God is speaking, even right now. Just think about, what is God saying to you? If you're a Christian, you're one of his sheep, okay? And he cares about you, and his sheep hear his voice. He's speaking. What's he saying to you, what's he what's he saying about your family, about your job, about your heart condition, about the way you're spending your time or your finances? What's he saying about you or to you? What's he want? What message does he want you to get? Don't harden your heart and become dull in hearing. And then let your worship carry out into your week, Monday, Monday through um, Friday, not just Friday, uh, Monday through Sunday. All right, uh, Monday through Saturday. 24-7, let it carry out through your, throughout your week through your obedience to God. Amen? And so, worship team, if you'd come up, it is appropriate for us to respond with the song of worship and praise to this psalm, to what God has spoken to us through his word. It's appropriate for us to worship. And so let's do that. And as we do... Just think about what, what's God saying to you? What's he highlighting? Today, if you'll hear his voice, don't harden your hearts.